Welcome. My name is Sevda Jan Aslan and um, we are organizing this lecture series on critical theories uh, and analysis of digital capitalism. I organize it together with uh, Thomas Almer and Christian Fuchs. And uh, we are now very glad to welcome our first guest, Graham Murdoch, um, for uh, this talk. And uh, well, what is uh, to say about Graham? We talked about it in the in the class an hour ago. Uh, he has taught everywhere in the <laughs> in the uh, on on Earth now, but he has been uh, at a lot of places uh, around the world, uh, a lot of um, universities like uh, Auckland. He taught in California, Mexico City, Stockholm, and uh, Shanghai, and uh, is a Professor Emeritus at now. How am I going to pronounce this right? Love bra. That's how I yeah, pronounce. That'll, that, that'll be fine. Okay. Um, it's one of those names, English names, nobody can pronounce. It's okay. okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, and his work has been translated in over 20 languages. He is the editor and also writer of a couple of books that you will also get to know during your studies, or you already got to know some of them uh, in the last semesters. So I'm really glad to welcome you here, and I would say, a uh, big round of applause for our first guest of this lecture. Well, well uh, thank you all very much for uh, coming and uh, for, for the invitation. Uh, my, my apologies for speaking in English. My, my German is not adequate to say what I want to say in this lecture. Um, but I'm delighted to be part of what looks like a fantastic lineup of speakers addressing what is clearly one of the critical issues that we all face. You'll see that I've uh, put the word critical in the title of this lecture. It often confuses people, what does it mean? Uh, so let me tell you what I mean by it. This may not be everybody's understanding. Three, three things. First of all, a critical perspective is looking behind the obvious. There's a very famous quote from Marx that comes in the middle of Das Kapital. This one, we must leave the noisy sphere of exchange and consumption where everything takes place on the surface in full view of everyone and enter the hidden abode of production. So what he's saying is if you want to understand capitalism, just walking around the streets and looking at fantastic array of things that you can buy in the shops and watching people uh, swipe their card and take them home, is only the end of a chain, that there's a huge backstory of how do those things arrive there, who makes them, under what conditions. But we also have to go back a little bit further. Marx was particularly interested in the organisation of, of production, but he was very well aware that for production to take place, it required energy, but it also required resources, minerals and metals, what this is made of. So we have to go back even further and ask, how do we get hold of those things and how do we organize them? So the first point of critical inquiry is to go, is to go behind what is the obvious and to look at this uh, backstory. And of course, it's a historical process. The other really important thing about this way of looking is it's not focused only on the present. It's focused on the long historical processes, deep processes that are shaping our lives. That's the first thing. Second thing is why would you bother to do that? Well, you would do it because in order to understand, you need to identify the centers of power. You need to understand what is who and what is organizing this process. So critical inquiry is very much about uh, the distribution of power and the possibilities of resistance. But it's also about the consequences of the decisions that are taken. So it's about inequality. It's about deprivation. It's about denying people a full life. And that brings us, I think, to the fundamental reason why I have always wanted to be part of this which is that it's 
fundamentally connected to moral philosophy. That is, the reason you want to know these things is to do something about them. There's no point in understanding inequality, how, how it works, unless you want to rectify it. So for me, it's always been as much a political project as an intellectual project. And you can see why this is necessary if you look at these two maps of the world. This one over here is a map that shows the, the, the density of CO2 emissions by cap, per capita, each individual person in those countries. So the deep red areas are countries that are using huge amounts of CO2. Not surprising. You see the United States, you see Australia, uh, and you see uh, Europe, not quite as bad, but pretty bad. And you see the Gulf states here. If you live in the desert, you need air conditioning, so not surprising. But you'll notice that there are these huge white areas, which are basically most of the global south. Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and a great deal of Asia, particularly India. If we look at this one, what this shows is the areas of the world that are likely to be livable by the year 2070 if we have global warming over two degrees. And you'll see it's the mirror image of that one there. That is, the unlivable areas are all in the global south and the livable areas are up in the north. So we have a, a fundamental moral and political challenge that the privileges that we currently enjoy, including the privileges of using all of this technology, are largely bought at the expense of people in the Southern Hemisphere. One of them is this man, Ibrahim. He's 20 years old. He works in the biggest electrical dump in the world. It's just outside Accra in Ghana. And what he does is try to strip the coatings off copper wire to sell the wire back. But in order to do that, they have to heat it in a fire. So he's already badly injured. You can see this is part of his testimony to a, 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 an anthropologist. We burn our bodies here, we hurt. We know it is no good. But how do we live? Life in the north is hard. We need this. He is the son of a tribal chief. He should be back in his village presiding over an agricultural system. But he can't do that because global warming is destroying the basis of his village subsistence life. So he has to go down to Accra and earn money to send back to his family. So he's a, he's, I want you to remember him as we go through some of the more abstract uh, things, because basically this is about human lives. This is about our responsibility for these invisible others. They're the army that are behind our uh, way of life. And you can see how incredibly unequal the world is at the moment, that almost half of the CO2 emissions are coming from the highest tenth of the world's population over here. The bottom 10% are contributing less than 1%. It's a huge disparity and it's actually an obscene inequality. And you can see that it also works within countries. You can compare countries, and China, for example, has started to be a major emitter. But if you look at these, uh, if you look at these figures by decile, you see they all have the <laughs> same pattern. That is, the richest are the greatest emitters and the poorest are the least. Almost exactly the same. So, Somewhere like India is, is emitting in total much less than the United States and uh, the European Union, but it's the same pattern. So it's 
the guys with the private jets and the yachts and all of that, they're manufacturing huge amounts of uh, emissions. So what that tells us is that we're faced with a double challenge. And I found this diagram particularly useful. It comes from a, uh, a very good feminist political economist, Kate Raworth. And she describes livable space as this light green circle here. This is, this is where we want to live. But in order for that circle to be viable, we have to do two things. We have to make sure we don't overshoot uh, natural boundaries. Uh, we, have to, we have to pull back our despoilation of the environment. But we also have to pay attention to all of those historic uh, struggles that have been going on since the 18th century. Struggles for dignity, struggles for equality, struggles for recognition. The, what, what we think of as the substance of politics in the West is still very much uh, on the agenda. But we have to add to that a serious engagement with the uh, overshoots of the natural resources. So politics now has to be facing both ways. You could imagine a green economy that was still massively unequal, in which case we wouldn't have gained very much. We, were, we, we, would, have, we would have settled some of these questions on the outer ring, but we would still be faced with massive gender, race, and other inequalities and injustices. So for me, politics now is, is environmental issues are not a separate issue. They are a second dimension, a necessary second dimension of politics. Because unless they're addressed, everything else collapses. We're all finished. So we, we have to address them. But we also have to keep paying attention to those very old embedded historical inequalities and injustices. Now that's by way of introduction. We'll come back to some of those issues in a minute. But let's just uh, remind ourselves of some very basic things. We're talking about global warming, we're talking about greenhouse gases. And basically there are two major. Carbon dioxide, which is the one that everybody talks about, that accounts for about 75% of emissions. But there's a second one, which is very important to remember, methane, which is at the moment 16%. Those are the two key gases that we have to try to control. Oh, it's, it's frozen. It's demanding, it's demanding a name, which I don't have. Uh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, what's important to remember is we, we, this CO2 can stay in the atmosphere for 200 years. So even if, we, even if we stopped now and never emitted anything else, we would still be living with this incredible legacy that goes back to the early industrial period. Not, not all CO2, some of it is 50 years, but some of it is 200 years old and it's still there. Um, but what's happened recently is that the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere has massively increased and it's increased from about 1990. You can see this 45 degree uh, slope here, this red area. So yes, it's been accumulating and it, it begins, as you know, with the uh, uh, rolling out of the steam engine and the burning of coal and so on uh, in, the, in, the, in the early industrial period. And then, of course, the age of oil and petroleum. Uh, but something really chronic has happened since 1990. So we have to ask ourselves, what? Why, why has it shot up like that? Well, we can begin to think about some causes for that. The important thing to remember is that that period from, the, from about 1990 onwards coincides with the neoliberal counter-revolution in economics. So what's happened around the world, including 
the old communist states, uh, including China, is that governments have rode back from state management and state control of the economy and put more and more of economic life into competitive markets and into private ownership of companies, uh, what, 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 what we can call marketization. Uh, that has been driven primarily by fossil fuels. That, that what, what's happened is a lot of, a lot of countries that were, use, were colonies have wanted to catch up industrially. India would be a very good example. Uh, and they've gone for broke and they've underpinned their industrialization with dirty coal, basically, but also, also with oil. The other thing that's happened is that that has been accompanied by a massive increase in consumption. Uh, that whereas in, in, in many societies people were living at, at a relatively modest, almost subsistence level, they are now part of a global consumer system. In some ways that's to be admired. They, they are better off than they were, they, they, they have uh, a, a, a more comfortable life, but it's a, it's a life that's been built around individual consumption. And that's where the internet comes in. It's precisely at this moment that the internet is privatized. The internet used to be a public resource, yeah? but it isn't anymore. It's now a, a privatized zone. And the companies, as, we're, as we'll come back to in a minute, the companies that have been able to take advantage of that in the United States have benefited from the almost total absence of regulation in the American system. So that there's been almost nothing to stop Zuckerberg and, and, and all, all the rest of them from accumulating incredible corporate power. We, we, we have the most concentrated corporate system the world has ever seen. Well, I'll come back and show you some statistics in a minute. So the internet, which became the network that connected everybody together, the core of our digital lives, has been sucked into this system of hyper-consumption and uh, corporate control. Just to give you an idea, the, these, are the, these, are the, the, these are the figures for, for the increase in uh, fossil fuels. And you can see from 1965 onwards, but particularly from here, shoots up. So we're actually, we've actually managed to achieve a kind of a, a, a globalization of capitalism on the basis of hugely polluting energy sources. So you might say, well, what has digital media got to do with all of this? Well, two crucial things. First of all, digital media have become the primary platform for what I call hyper-consumption. I'll explain in a minute what, what that is. But they're also, and this comes back to the backstory, they're also assemblies of infrastructures, satellites, cables under the sea, telegraph poles, all kinds of physical installations and all kinds of devices, cell phones, laptops, Game Boys and so on. All of those require energy and all of them are made of resources. They're made of metals, they're made of glass, they're made of all kinds of things. And we've manufactured huge amounts of them in the last 30 years. In fact, more than ever, and we'll come back to this in a minute, one, one, of the, one of the problems is the accelerated rate of obsolescence. We're now on the 15th iteration of the iPhone. So what happens to the other 14 iPhones? Well, they end up where Ibrahim is working in that huge dump, stripping the wires off for copper. Uh, we're throwing them away every 18 months. Um, and, and that's, it's, if you're of a certain generation, and most of you are, and I'm not, as you can see, I'm an old man, I can remember families like my family saving up for a radio. We saved up for a radio. And uh, when we got it, it was very, very important and, and a great ceremony. It came in the house. It was a huge thing with a you know, wooden, wooden cabinet. 
Um, and if it broke down, there was a little guy in the village who had spare parts. He would come and mend it for you. People expected to buy one machine for their life. And if it went wrong, to be able to repair it. They certainly didn't think of having a different one every three years. That would be inconceivable. It would also be inconceivable economically. So we, we've, we've put ourselves in the situation of relying economically on a, on a hyper-consumer system. Now, there's a lot to say about this, but, and we can come back to it, if you like, in, 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 in questions. But what, what do I mean by it? Well, first of all, we've been encouraged to buy more and to throw things away more quickly. We're also now in, in a situation of being able to buy things 24 hours a day. The, you, the shop doesn't shut for Jeff Bezos. You can buy it whenever you like. Uh, there's been a massive, and this is, this is a real kind of uh, Achilles heel in the economy, a massive increase in credit. It's almost, you, you can buy things without having the money there ready. Again, that's quite recent. Credit is, was not part, for, for most ordinary people, credit wasn't possible. People didn't have credit. They didn't, certainly didn't have credit cards. The other thing that's happened is that, that we, we've, we've moved to a cashless economy. So that, you know, if you, if you buy some, you go into a shop and you, 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 you have banknotes and lots of shops won't take them anymore. Um, you count them out and you, you, it gives you time to reconsider. You think, mm, that's rather a lot, actually, 15 euros. Mm, I'm not sure about that. And you might decide you don't buy the thing after all. But if you just swipe your phone, it doesn't even register, does it? I mean, it's not there. It's invisible. But the other thing, the, the other two things I want to stress is that we live in an advertising saturated culture. There's been a massive explosion of media, both what are called legacy media, um, unfortunate term, but let, let, let's talk about television. The last 30 years have seen around the world a massive ratcheting up of commercial television in countries that never had it before. India, for example. India used to have a single monopoly state television system, Dordestan. And then in the early 90s, that was broken and huge numbers of commercial operators came in, all of them saturated with advertising. But it's not advertising as we've understood it. It's not that you have an advertisement next to the newscast or next to the film that the promotion is integrated into the cultural forms. Product placement would be uh, an early form of that, where uh, actors are paid to talk up products while they're, you know, fighting or doing whatever. Uh, it's, because, it's gone way past that. So we, 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 live in a, we live in a society that is absolutely saturated, the, the, the dominant voice is a voice of commerce. And what it tells us is something very specific. It tells you that to be a fully satisfied human being, you need to consume as much as possible. That people will not value you if you have few possessions. So we, we've, we've been psychologically conditioned to think of ourselves as successful in terms of what we own, what we can show to people, what we display. And the cell phone, of course, has been fundamental. It's on 24-7, and what we mostly use it for is scanning the internet, social media, and then a little bit later, uh, music and games. But all of those sites are saturated with advertising. And here we have the paperless, contactless cash. Uh, it's so easy to buy things now. There's no friction. In fact, it's called in the trade frictionless transactions. Uh, you don't have to do anything. You just have to swipe your phone around in the air. Uh, I want to take one consequence. There are many consequences of this, but let's take one, and that's food. Here's methane 
Methane stays in the atmosphere for a very short time relative to CO2, average of 12 years, but it's many times more potent in terms of its global warming effect. Some estimates it's up to 80 times more powerful. So one of the things we could do uh, if we wanted to address uh, global warming quickly is to drastically reduce the amount of methane. Uh, addressing CO2 is, is, is more problematic because it stays in the atmosphere for longer. But methane we could do something about relatively quickly. So why is there so much methane about? Well, you'll see that the biggest chunk, this orange section here, is livestock farming, cattle. And a little bit up here, rice. Now, methane is also a natural phenomenon. It's, it's locked in the, in, in the Arctic tundra, for example. But it, and it's also uh, generated in quite large quantities uh, in uh, certain forms of production, particularly concrete making. But livestock farming is a major contributor to uh, methane emissions. And that coincides with a, with a seismic change in world food towards much more meat eating and particularly towards beef. And you can see that of the various things you can eat, beef is by far and away the biggest offender in terms of greenhouse uh, uh, emissions. Uh, but personally, I'm not that fond of beans and lentil. I wish I was a bit more sort of uh, PC about it. But you see that if you really wanted to be a good person, you, you could live on beans and, and, and lentils. Um, I mean, it's a question of balance, isn't it? But beef, the, the, there's been a massive global explosion of eating, eating beef because it's a fundamental ingredient of convenience food. And that comes back to this idea of the kind of integrated persuasion. This is Ryan. Ryan is mo one of the most successful uh, promoters on YouTube. He started when he was six years old. He now earns billions of dollars and um, he has his own food chain and his, uh, his own clothing chain. Here he is representing, uh, promoting McDonald's. Yeah? He's promoting it to children. Yeah? He's incredibly popular. But what's the consequence of Ryan every day appearing like this and, and, and eating McDonald's and playing with the Mac McDonald's themed uh, objects? It's a public health catastrophe. Here are two kids in a diner in New York, right? Look at them. They're six years old. They're going to die. They're, they're going to get diabetes. They're going to get, they're, they're, they're massively reducing their life expectancy. We, we know that that's going to be the case. And yet we, we have a media system that uh, saturates their world, their imaginative world with Ryan and, and, and his friends. And this is not only, it, beef eating used to be a luxury. For most people in the world, the idea of eating meat particularly beef, would be unimaginable. It's very, very expensive. But now you see what's happened is, if we, if we look at the obesity statistics, this line here is uh, the line for low-income countries. And you see it shot up, and you see when it started to shoot up, the same 45 degree line that we've seen on so many of the other uh, diagrams. So that uh, one of the successes, if you like, of the kind of new commercial culture that has uh, ebbed out across the world is, is to destroy children's health. But it's worse than that because if we go back, where does that beef come from? It comes from forest clearances. These are the figures for two, 2019. This is a football pitch sized area of rainforest lost every six seconds in 2019. A lot of it was lost in the Amazon under Bolsonaro because huge areas of the Amazon were cleared for cattle farming because it's much more uh, profitable. Here's the, 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 again, this is for, for 
2020 in uh, the Amazon, you saw rainforest disappearing. 17 times the size of New York City was lost between 2020 and 2021. That was Bolsonaro's legacy. What happens when you do that is not only that relationship to children's health, but it's two other important things. The Amazon now emits more CO2 than it sequesters. It used to be one of the places in the world's surface that would suck CO2 out of the atmosphere and, and store it. Now, at the moment, it's generating more CO2 than it, 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 uh, it collects. But it's also one of the primary uh, reasons that we're getting an acceleration of pandemics. Most diseases in the world, three quarters, are zoonotic diseases. They're transmitted from animals to humans. And the, la the last three corona outbreaks, SARS, MERS uh, and COVID, were all transmitted to animals via bats. So what happens when you clear forests is that you destroy the habitat of animals, particularly bats. They have to go somewhere. They migrate into areas which are more densely human habitation. They infect domestic and, 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 and farm animals and they pass on zoonotic diseases. So the price of a hamburger is very, very high. It's a price in health. It's a price in disease, uh, but it's also a price in CO2. Let's look a little bit more at the other dimension, the other backstory, the idea of the material basis of communication. If we look at the history of, of, of communication since the industrial period, you see what I, what I call a, the illusion of immateriality. Here you have a, 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 a painting of a railway mail train. It's fairly clear that that's polluting. You can see the smoke, the smoke's rising out of that uh, and, and here it's coming out of the engine. And people complained a lot at the time about railway trains and, and pollution. That was a pretty, pretty obvious. So you, you put, you put the, the mail onto the train and it, it, it transported it between cities. It was a, a major advantage in terms of, of speed of communication. But it also coincided with the invention of the electric telegraph. And that appeared to be, for, to many people, appeared to be a magical system because you couldn't see any physical reality to it. You came along to the telegraph office, you gave the telegraph operator who was almost certainly using Morse code to tap out, uh, translate the, 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 the message. Um, it travelled through the wires and while it was travelling you couldn't see it. It arrived at the other end and another telegraph operator decoded it, wrote it out and a little messenger would take it round to your house. So there was a kind of, uh, at both ends of the chain, a, a, a physical presence. But the actual telegraph itself appeared to be this magical system where things, all that was solid, melts into air, as Marx would say. Well, we, that, that gave people the impression that it was costless. It wasn't polluting in the way that, you know, the the old railway train was. You could see that. You couldn't see the pollution in, in the telegraph system. You can't see it with broadcasting. You can't see it with the radio spectrum. And you can't, you can't when, you know, when, when you have the internet, you can't, it's, it's not dropping like rain, you know, you can't see anything. It just appears. But it's an illusion because it forces us to forget the backstory. And the telegraph is, is actually, uh, the, the telegraph is, is, is very interesting. Um, uh, 
Let's take, we'll come back in a minute to that. Let's take the iPhone. The important thing to remember about the iPhone, you, you are constantly exhorted. You are, you, are, you are told you're a bad person if you keep charging your iPhone, you leave it on overnight, you're, you know, destroying the world. Well, yeah, it's good not to waste energy. But the real truth, and this, this, is, this is Apple's own figures, 80% of the greenhouse emissions of a phone are already in the machine before you buy it. They're incurred in the process of producing the machine. But that history is not visible to you because it's far away. It's often people like Abraham. You never see them, but they're there. And without them, you wouldn't have a mobile phone. So in order to address the problem of emissions, it's primarily a problem of corporate activity. And if we look, uh, if we, if we look at the, the different uh, uh, stages, you see it begins with extraction. It begins with minerals. Uh, and then you have a system of, of, of production and assembly, then of transportation, then of energy, then of replacement, and then of waste. That's the chain. Uh, we only really enter that story here. But the rest of it is invisible to us. But it's not without consequence. And the telegraph is a good example. The telegraph system, the global telegraph system, required cables to be laid under the oceans, uh, both the Pacific and the Atlantic. It was a huge achievement to do that. But there's a problem if you, these are copper wires. Cop copper is also has to be mined and, and, and processed. But copper wires corrode in salt water. So they had to find a substance that would protect the copper, insulate the copper from salt water. And a number of different uh, substances were tried. But eventually they, they settled on this one, which is something called gutta persia. It's like, it's like rubber, it's like it's a resin that, that you get from trees. But unfortunately, it wasn't very well distributed around the, the Earth's surface. Most of it was in Indonesia. And in order to get it, they had to destroy huge amounts of Indonesian forest, along with the life of the people that lived there. So that this is a classic case where part of the backstory of extraction of, of, of in energy and, and metals uh, and substances is a story of dispossession, what David Harvey calls accumulation through dispossession. Somebody has to be pushed out of the way in order to make space for what we want. And that process is still going on. This is the Carmichael mine in the middle of Queensland. It's supplying energy for Adani in India. Adani is one of the biggest corporations in India and, and Adani is one of the uh, closest intimates of, of Modi. Look at it. That is on historic Aboriginal land. Land that was sacred to the people that lived there because in Aboriginal cosmology, and the, this is a, an Aboriginal tie, that land was meaningful for their whole history of themselves. And, and their sense of their relationship to the world. It's never going to be restored, is it? Look at that. Uh, and that's only part. Is that the Carmichael mine is the biggest mine complex ever constructed in the world. Uh, and it's there to service Indian industrialization. So Dispossession is still very much part of the living history that we have every day, and I can give you lots and lots of examples. There are also huge tensions, geopolitical tensions over command of strategic minerals. One of, one of, the, one of the most important is cobalt. Cobalt is, at the moment, uh, absolutely fundamental to the batteries that go into so many digital appliances. Nearly half of the world's cobalt supplies are in the Congo, People's Republic of Congo. Um, the Congo is, is, has been for a very long time an unstable area politically, but it's also an, an area which is notorious for child labour. A lot of the 
a lot of the mines now are these open open mines that some of them have been abandoned by by the big corporations and they're, and they're worked primarily by children looking for what the residues are because they're actually very very valuable so again when we pick up our phone those children's lives are somewhere inside it they can't speak to us but they're there and then when you look at the you look at the, the process of production and assembly. That's a Foxcom factory, it's a Taiwanese company operating in China, and this is an Amazon warehouse. Marx would have had no trouble recognizing these are these are as bad as the cotton factories that he foregrounds in, in Capital. Uh, we haven't progressed in terms of the organization of labor. These people are monitored second by second to make sure that they don't uh, slack, that they make sure they keep up with the pace of production. Uh, this is a 19th century system at the heart of what is supposed to be a post-industrial economy. Transportation, most of the objects, particularly the digital objects that, that we consume are transported on container ships. Look how much bigger they've got over time. So we're now looking at gigantic container ships. You remember the one that got stuck in the Suez Canal that couldn't be turned around? Uh, they're even bigger now. Uh, they're very polluting of the oceans, very damaging of marine life. But they're mostly, uh, the, most of the seamen who are operating them are... Uh, casual, unlicensed, and they were operating on ships that are sailing under flags of convenience. There's very little uh, control over this. Uh, it's a very uh, potent point of exploitation. And then we come to waste. Well, not just Ibrahim. We're building huge pyramids. They're, they're, like, the, they're like a kind of perverse pyramid of Egypt gigantic piles of old circuit boards, of old, old, old machines, uh, which will never biodegrade. And they're incredibly damaging uh, to the uh, environment. But I have some news for you, it's going to get a lot worse. It's going to get a lot worse because we're moving towards fatter forms of data that, that we're, we're moving towards video and audio, we're moving towards gaming, we're moving towards streaming. That huge amounts of, of data, if, if, you look, if you look at uh, type and, 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 and single images, it, it's minuscule. But this stuff is huge. And it's stored in these huge factory-like complexes that have to consume huge amounts of energy, but also water, because they have to be cooled. Uh, and in many of the locations where they're situated, there are, are, are ongoing disputes over water, because they, they're, taking, they're taking the water that could be used for other purposes. Here's some very simple statistics. Some of these data centers are consuming more electricity than entire countries in the global south. So here, here are the data centers, yeah? Uh, they're consuming more than Egypt, Argentina, Colombia, and Nigeria. These are countries. Yeah? These, are, these are the data centers of a handful of, of corporations. And if you look at the projections, these are the projections to, to 2030, which isn't that far away. The, these, are, these are projections for electricity demand. And you'll see that the, the, the biggest uh, increases are going to be down here, the green area, which is data centers, uh, and the blue, which is networks. Um, consumer devices are here. This is us. We're, we're a, a spot. On the, on the landscape in, in this. The real, the real business is not you. The real business is, is all of that that's being uh, transmitted by, by corporations. 
Here's another statistic that might shock you. Californian gamers, <laughs> here they are, 2021, they're consuming more electricity than many countries just to play the most elaborate game that you can buy. I find that utterly shocking. This is just one state in the United States, not even the whole of the United States. I mean, California is a very rich uh, state, but look at that. You know, it's, it's more than all of these countries, Senegal, Haiti, El Salvador, Kenya again. So that's the world that we, that's the backstory. So we come to, we come to AI, there's a lot to say about that. But here's a very, here's a, the calculations are quite difficult to make at the moment. But here, here's, here's one attempt, which is often, uh, often quoted. This is, this is a human life. The, these are, the, this is the carbon footprint of one average human life on the globe. You see, that's, it's 11. Down here, this is the amount of emissions that is generated by training something like Jack, chat GPT, yeah? You see that it's hugely different and it's getting bigger and bigger because the more complex AI systems become, the more data they require. Um, and who controls that system? Well, here we are. This is the latest figures. These are the 10 biggest companies in the world by market capitalization. Now, market capitalization isn't the only way you can measure the size of a company. What market capitalization is, it's the number of shares multiplied by their stock value on the, on the stock exchange. So it, it, it's not actually measuring resources. It's not the value of the resources. It's, it's actually the, the value of the shares. But there are only two companies in the top 10 which are not digital companies. One of them is the Saudi state oil company, not surprisingly. But the other one is Berkshire Hathaway, which is Warren Buffett's uh, hedge fund. And what does Warren Buffett invest in? Half of Warren Buffett's current portfolio, 51%, is invested in Apple. So he's also part of this digital system. He, he's become very well known. He, he, he was one of the early funders for many of the now dominant uh, digital companies like Facebook and, and, and Alphabet and so on. But he's a, he's a major figure in, uh, in, in, in Alphabet. So let, what do you need for AI? And AI is going to be the, the dominant uh, uh, cons constellation in, in the in digital media in the coming years? Well, first of all, you need, you need storage. You need, you need somewhere to put all of that data. And that's where cloud, cloud markets come in. And we have a world system now that is dominated by three companies. Amazon Web Services, this one here. Azure, which is Microsoft and the Google Cloud Platform, which is a subsidiary of Alphabet. So three companies actually control most of the data repositories that are being used to generate artificial intelligence. What else do you need? Well, you need uh, to design the systems. And again, you can see very familiar names. Microsoft is, uh, had a, a second life. It has a, 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 a relationship with OpenAI, which is the one that, 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 that was pioneering uh, large language models. And they've just signed a deal where everything that OpenAI does will be on the Azure platform. Alphabet has famously DeepMind, which was the, the uh, uh, AI system that, that played Go. You remember that they, they, they had a competition with, the, with that uh, uh, Asian uh, board game and, and uh, DeepMind beat 
the world's best Go player. It's got much more elaborate since then. They also have something called Google Brain. Um, Amazon is also very much. Uh, but there's, a, there, there, there's a, a country called Anthropic, which is very uh, important, but it's now dominated by both Alphabet and Amazon who've invested in it. And this is a classic case. So what happens is you get these startups uh, and if they look as though they're going to be important, they simply get gobbled up by, by the big companies. Uh, you see that, you see that with, with Meta, that used to be Facebook. They bought Instagram because it was a threat. They, they buy up anything that looks like it's going to be a problem and incorporate it into it. So, and there's been nothing uh, up until recently. There are now some regulatory noises, but up until recently, there's been nothing to stop them. They've been allowed to do this without any let or hindrance uh, in a way that would have been inconceivable for most other co corporate sectors. Um, they're also, uh, IBM is still there. They, they, have a, they have an old system called Watson. Uh, it's not named after Dr. Watson, the, the mate of Sherlock Holmes. It, uh, it was one of the executives of IBM that, that they dedicated it to. Uh, Meta, of course, want to have this uh, uh, three-dimensional world. And NVIDIA, which is one of the, one of, one of the, major, uh, one of the major companies uh, down here uh, is also in the running. So basically what, what's happened is that the, the innovation that is taking place in, in the digital world is comprehensively commandeered by the same companies. They've been incredibly adept at moving into these areas and colonising them. And what that means is that we are now in the situation of running to catch up. So you see, you know, the European Union is trying to uh, discipline these companies, but it, it's, it's already confronting a situation it had no part in designing. So we don't really have a public policy for digital media. What we have are, 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 are corporate strategies which then force public agencies to respond to try to limit the damage. Uh, so they, they, they've managed to commandeer uh, a very uh, large chunk of our future. One of the ways I think about that is the idea of enclosure, that at the beginning, at the beginning of the industrial system, uh, land was fenced off, land that used to be available for public use was fenced off and became uh, the property of private landlords who then charged people uh, to use it. What I think we've seen since uh, 1990 in the digital era is a, is a massive f ratcheting up of enclosure where things that used to be public are now corporate. The internet is a, is, is, is a good example. But you also see the corporate command of research and development. Universities are very much part of this, but not as autonomous research institutions. They're as research and development wings of the large corporations. So that as, particularly in, 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 in my country, as public, public funding for universities has shrunk, universities have been forced to look elsewhere for money. And they've looked to the big corporations who are only too happy to fund research but that research becomes their property. It's not released into the public domain. In fact, often it can't even be published, or if it is published, it's, it's redacted. Uh, so lo lots of the most important pieces of information are not accessible because it becomes intellectual property. Um, so there's been a, a kind of a co-option of, of, of public research. But a lot of this, and go back to political economy a little while, a lot of this has been driven by the sea change in the organisation of, uh, of the economy. Uh, we've seen an incredible reduction of the taxes on corporations and high wealth individuals. It used to be up there with about 80% in a lot of countries. It's now down to 25 whatever. 
So not only have they been allowed to capture all sorts of resources, but they've been allowed to keep almost all of the money that they've made. So very little of it has gone back into the public purse. And then if you, if you look at what happened in 2008 in the, in, in the financial crisis, basically Western governments bailed the banks out and they engaged in something which is, has a kind of mysterious title. It's called quantitative easing. What they did was basically print money and the idea was that that money would go into the economy and people would spend it and it would regenerate. Most of that money actually went into corporate holdings. Um, it didn't circulate generally. So to come back to where I started, we need to understand that the political economy of media and digital media in particular can't be uncoupled from this massive reorganization of the global economy around markets and around uh, private uh, enterprise. So if you have enclosure, what is the alternative? Well, historically, the alternative was something called the commons. And I think the big struggle that we have now is to retrieve the commons. Now, for me, the, the, the commons is, is made up, first of all, of all of those public resources that are funded out of taxation, libraries, museums, uh, and all of that. But also all of, the, all of that self-generated, uh, peer-organized activity that's coming up, from, be, be, uh, coming up from underneath. So there is an alternative to this, this corporate capture, but it needs to be uh, promoted and it needs to be protected. And at the moment, it's being decimated. Uh, we see governments around the world having no interest in cultivating this alternative. Uh, we need to oppose that uh, as vigorously as possible. We need to defend the public institutions that we currently have, uh, but we also need to look for ways of incorporating this incredibly uh, diverse uh, grassroots activity where people are what I call what, what, what I've called in my own work gift economies the people engaging together to make something for no charge simply donating their expertise their time to make something that is available to everybody and is a public benefit the classic example that everybody quotes is Wikipedia Wikipedia is the biggest encyclopedia in the history of the world it's been created entirely by voluntary donation. Nobody's ever been paid for writing anything for Wikipedia, uh, and yet there it is. Okay, it's, the quality is variable, but for the things that I know about, I would say there's some outstanding contributions to Wikipedia. Um, and I know who've been writing them. They've been written by some of the best minds that we have. So it is possible to imagine something that is incredibly important, but is not commercialized. But to come back finally to the issue that I raised, in the end, this is a fundamental question about what do we think a good society is? What kind of a society do we want? At the moment, the dominant uh, discourse is, revolves around a, something called progress. Progress is measured by quantities of economic growth and accumulation. So if you look at the statistics, countries are ranked by how many telephones they have, how many cars they have, and so on. This is the system that has driven us to the brink of environmental uh, destruction. We need, we need to row back from that. And we need to think of a society as a good society, as a society that provides resources for everyone to thrive uh, outside of the market. There will always be markets and that's fine. There's no point in nationalizing uh, the production of ties, for example. It was one of the problems the Soviet Union had that they couldn't understand that uh, fashion shoes, though very sad, they, they did try to nationalize the production of shoes and they, they, they would go around and do these big surveys, ask people, what kind of shoe do you want? 
And they go, oh, we want one with really big heels. So they gear up all the factories to make them. And by the time they made them, people wanted something else. They go, oh, I don't want that. Uh, so there are some things that is pointless uh, to, to take out of the market. But there are some things that it's pointless to put into the market. Health, education, and a great deal of uh, information. These are building blocks for a good life, both at an individual level and also at a collective level. And if we let them go, then we're in deep, deep trouble. And the struggle is not only to defend them, to, to be, but to promote them in a way that is environmentally sustainable. Because if it's not, everything else is pointless. Okay, I'll stop there and um, open it up for questions. Thank you very much for this inspiring uh, lecture. Um, in the class we have before this lecture, um, we are always discussing the texts of um, of the people who come here for the lecture uh, with the students, and then the students try to find questions um, according to the or mm, relating to the text that we read with them. And you gave us one of your manuscripts, um, and now I want to ask our students to ask the questions that we found in class today. Um. Can you squeeze? Yeah. So the first question that we um, formulated for you yeah. uh, is, it seems like your text was focused mainly on Western markets, but you also have a lot of experience with teaching and research in non-Western countries. Um, how do your arguments apply to non-Western markets and society? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. I mean, uh, Every, every, I, I can't, th as I say, the, the only exception would be North Korea, which I've, ne I've never visited. But e everywhere else there's been this, you, you, have, to, you have to remember that uh, a, a number of countries were, for example, military dictatorships. So South Korea would be a very good example, yes? So, you know, they, they, they spent uh, the first few decades of, of independence under military rule, and that was extremely directive and, 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 and very authoritarian. So, not surprisingly, uh, moving towards markets and choice seemed like a liberation for people. You know, it seemed like a, a fantastic break with the past. And that, that was true of, 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 of other countries as well. Taiwan was a military dictatorship. Yeah? And again, you see Taiwan and South Korea have, be, have become, you know, some of the vanguard countries in, in the new industrialization. Uh, but there's a cost to that, uh, which people are now beginning to understand, that basically what happens is that you, you hollow out the society, you, you individualize the society and I think that that that's what people are beginning to understand now that that the, the, the cost of that is 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 to break a lot of the old bonds that held people together and and cast them out in in a, in a, in a very kind of exposed uh, way of, in, into into competitive markets um, and and that takes a human cost. It takes a cost in health, but also in, in, in mental health. So you see suicide rates rising in somewhere like, like South Korea uh, because uh, pe people are under so much pressure to uh, make it in that society and, and their support systems are being, air, being taken away. China's another very interesting example. Um, and under the old system, uh, which, which had many, many flaws, but it, 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 it had one good thing, that if you were, if you were a worker, you, be, you belonged to something called a work unit. Let's say you, you worked in a factory, and your work unit guaranteed you a pension, it guaranteed you a nursery school for your children, it guaranteed you accommodation. It wasn't fantastic quality, but it was available to everybody, and it was your, your, your entitlement what the, uh, the, the, the reforms in China have done is to marketize the society. So it has some of the highest real estate prices anywhere in the world. I mean, Shanghai is more expensive than New York. 
Um, education is now privatized. Uh, healthcare is privatized. So people realized that in order that, that having given up that old kind of centrally directed system was replaced by a system that had its own savage kind of uh, ways of, of dividing people. And so there again, there, there's a lot of unhappiness, a lot of discontent and incredible inequality. The, 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 the gap between the richest and the poorest in China is one of the largest in the world more than in the United States. And that's happened very quickly. Now, that's one of the reasons why I think you've seen a revival of things like nationalism. If you, if you, if you take away a lot of the, of the bonds that bound people together at an intimate uh, basis in the neighborhood, for example, you've got to give them something else that makes them feel part of something bigger. And unfortunately, that something else is often nationalism of a, of a very kind of rabid and, 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 and fundamentalist kind. You see that in India now. You know, you see uh, Modi is promoting a, a, a version of Hindu nationalism which is incredibly destructive and, and totally ahistorical uh, because in, in India, in India's great uh, uh, strength historically has been its diversity. Um, but that, you know, that, that's not good enough because you don't want to tolerate diversity. You want to bring people together. You want to paper over the real differences with these kind of phantom imaginings of, of, of solidarity. So the, 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 there's been a kind of political backlash, I think, around the world. And you see, you see it coming in different forms. But it, it's a consequence of this kind of individualizing the, 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 the lives of people. People feel very exposed. And, and ironically, if, you, if you've read classical sociology, that's exactly what people felt in the 19th century. When, when they, moved to the, they moved from the village, that was a liberation because in a village, everybody knows your business. You can't, don't have any privacy and you know, all of that. And so people were, at one point, they were very happy to go to the city because they could be anonymous and they could be who they wanted to be and people weren't as judgmental and so on. But the price of that was they were lonely. And, and if, if you look at classical sociology, that, that notion, it's called various things, anomie, alienation, uh, that was a, a major theme, that, 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 that the destruction of intimate relations and the, uh, the lack of a, of, a, of a solid social base was, was a major preoccupation. And you have to remember that in a lot of these societies, China would be, China only, the majority of people in China only lived in towns in the last decade. It was primarily an agricultural village economy. So that, you know, urbanization for a lot of societies is something that is relatively recent. That, that huge migrations uh, into the city are, are, that we, we had in the 19th century and, and uh, are, are, are a living memory and, and experience for many families uh, in, in, in those countries uh, because the agricultural system is becoming more and more problematic and unsustainable. So people are moving and, you know, they move young, young, huge. It's the biggest migra the, the, the migration, particularly of young women in China, to work in factories like the Foxconn factory is the biggest physical migration in human history in terms of the number of people moving from one place to another. Phenomenal, really. Um, and that's very recent. So we're, we're still in a... We're, we're, that's why you, you, you need to pay attention to some of those classical uh, texts because we've uncannily reinvented exactly the problems that they were grappling with. Um, uh, so uh, they, they, they still speak to us about something that is, is, is very much a live issue. It, it's not something that belongs in the past. Very interesting, thank you. No, it's a, yeah, no, 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 we can carry on. <laughs> we have uh, three more questions. Um, the next one is, in your text, you suggest that the public service media should be funded by taxes of the global media companies at the end of your text. Um, but they wouldn't do it voluntarily, in our opinion. 
Um, how can that be solved in the political context? Well, that, that's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's also a very good question. I mean, what, 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 we, what we think of as public service media were, 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 were part of a, uh, a, a broader uh, a movement that, that, that begins, uh, begins really at the beginning of the 20th century, but particularly after World War I where uh, there, were, there was an attempt to, to, to create uh, new forms of publicness in, in the city. Um, so, you know, public parks would be one example of that. that, that, uh, that I mean, and and, and there, there were mixed, and, and public broadcasting uh, was another one. But there, there were mixed motives. I mean, parks were a good example. It was partly there was a, 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 a fear that... Uh, workers were too sickly so that, that, that taking exercise in the park would be good for them but also that if they weren't in the park they might be in the street demonstrating so it was very much a way of of kind what what what, what in england they called rational recreation they wanted people to be, be sensible in their leisure time they didn't want them to get falling down drunk and fighting and and arguing for the vote and so on so they, 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 there was a kind of repressive element to it but there was also something else that public parks are uh, can be used in all sorts of ways. And public broadcasting was, was similar. Public broadcasting was very much uh, introduced uh, after, after World War I as a way of, of bringing people together. And, and again, it was this idea that the, the radio spectrum allowed you to do something you couldn't do before. You could have newspapers, but you had to physically transport them around the country. But if you had a radio signal, in principle, anyone living in the country could hear it at the same time if they had, you know, an aerial. So that there was this huge optimism that it would kind of create a new uh, solidarity, that everybody would participate together, listening to the same thing at the same time. Um, so there, there were, but of course, it was also uh, um, what, what, we, what we call in English paternalistic. That, that is, that the, the idea was that, that as, a, as a public broadcast, you would be like a good father. You, 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 would, you would give people good advice and, and good information and, and uh, you, you would help them to develop sensibly. Uh, you, you, you wouldn't let things get out of control. So the same thing with the public parks. So there's always been that tension in, 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 in the public sector between control and a sort of generosity to give people something that they couldn't, either couldn't afford or couldn't have before. Libraries, take libraries. Most families couldn't afford to buy books, but they could borrow books from the library. And, and that was a huge uh, advance. But then, of course, you have, and you see it very much now in the, in the, in the United States uh, after Trump, arguments about what books sh people should be allowed to read. Right? I mean, in Alabama, they've just banned, in, 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 in one jurisdiction in Alabama, they've just banned the Bible because it's full of sex and violence, which indeed it is. People have turned into pillars of salt and all kinds of terrible things. One of the most violent books you could possibly read. Uh, and yet these are evangelical Christians, yes, who, who, for whom the Bible is their text. But actually, if you read the Bible, you find, oh, God, we don't want, the, we don't want the children to come across that bit of the Bible. Um, so, you know, that, that libraries have become a battleground now over what can be read and who can be allowed to see it and so on. So you've always got that tension in, in, in the public sector. But the important thing about it is that it's subject in principle to democratic oversight, that these are publicly funded institutions and we can argue about what the money is spent on. You can't argue what Netflix will make um, Netflix will make whatever it thinks it can sell. Um, uh, it doesn't consult you except as a consumer. Um, it has no interest in you except as a subscriber. Uh, so that whole kind of other sector of, of, of public provision, uh, yes, it's conflictual, but it's essential because it, it's, it's available outside of the market. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't take advertising and it doesn't require you to pay a subscription. 
as soon as you, as soon as you pay a subscription, you discriminate because if you if you come from a poor family, you can't afford it. Um, uh, so the, the point of public provision was to make available resources that everybody could have, with without. Uh, reference to their economic circumstances. And I think that, that's an incredibly important principle. Uh, how we organise them is, is up for grabs. And of course, it's a, a moving target because cultural understandings move through time. Um, but the, 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 the important issue is not, not everything belongs in the market. And it, 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 there, there are some things that shouldn't be in the market. I, I don't believe health should be in the market. I believe everybody has a right to health. And the only way that we can guarantee that is to pay for it collectively. Uh, um, same with education. It shouldn't be a commercial proposition. Uh, it should be available to everyone who, who merits it. But that means that we have to tackle taxation and that's where it becomes very difficult. Oh, there's some very interesting statistics just published that show oh, there's a kind of international study. The majority of people in a lot of societies are in favour of doing something about the environment. They would like things to be done, but they don't want to pay any money for it. Um, now that's a problem because uh, taxation is, 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 is the lever. Well, we could maybe get around that by saying, well, we ought to tax the corporations more than individuals. So we, th we always think of taxation as personal taxation, um, but there are all sorts of other taxes. So uh, we have to have an argument about what these corporations owe. Look at what's happened with artificial intelligence, a very good example. Those systems have been built by hoovering up everything that's on the internet. Well, a lot of that is the work of artists and writers who are not being paid. So they've stolen and, and people are now protesting uh, about that. They, they've stolen that work and incorporated it in, 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 into their systems without any consultation of the people who, who wrote it or originated it uh, and no payment. Um, so it, it's a form of theft. It's a form of grand theft actually. Um, and now you, you see a, a number of, 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 of writers are beginning to protest and, and, and uh, quite rightly so. Because if, if you're a writer, you know, you, you're a, you're, your income depends upon, you know, people, people uh, are paying to access your work. So the, these, uh, it, it's another example of the way in which we've never We've never, we, we've been caught out. We, we don't have the regulatory system that we need to control these things in a responsible way. They've just been allowed to do these things. And now we're saying, oh, well, no, we, we don't want that. We have to do it, have something different. It might be too late. Th those systems are already there. They're already operating. Um, you can't give them back. Um, um, so we're, I, I, think we, I, I think we've already, Whatever controls are imposed are, are going to be one step behind. That, that's, that's basically what, what you find. Th these corporations have been incredibly good at finding ways of evading paying for anything. Uh, There's a very famous example. Virtually all of the components of this machine were invented in public research laboratories. They've never paid a penny for any of those innovations. Uh, they just took them and, 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 and commercialized them. Um, so your resources have been basically stolen. And, and, and now, of course, they're, they're, they're protected by a wall of intellectual property. So, you know, you, you, that, companies like Apple defend their intellectual property vigorously. They even, you know, go to ridiculous lengths. They, they, they prosecute street vendors in Thailand who have an Apple logo on their stall in the street as a violation of their patent. Crazy. I mean, you know, they must, they must have a team of people 
who scour the world for these violations. I mean, many of them are ridiculously, I mean, this guy is selling, you know, he's selling sandwiches. I mean, he's not going to be a big threat, right? He just has a little apple on his, on a, on a, a, but you know, that, that's the, the lengths to which they will go. Uh, so it's, 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 it's massively asymmetric. They, you, you, you may not know, but there, there was a, a famous court case because the Beatles company was called Apple. Yes, and, and, and so there, there was a long running dispute about whether Apple should pay the Beatles for having used an Apple as their logo. But it was, it, it was decided that the, the Apples were sufficiently different not to be confused. Uh, so that was all right then. <laughs> And then I would like to uh, get some questions or maybe fun questions from the audience because yeah, we have about 10 minutes left. So maybe one more question from the students and then all of the audience can respond to the lecture. Yes. Okay. Um, you also, or we talked about the impact of the global media companies like Facebook and Google. And I guess many of us would say that there's kind of a social pressure to use these technologies and services. And um, is there a personal individual solution for that? Or, uh, and if yes, what would your suggestion be or your solution? Well, uh, yes, yeah, so it, again, it's a, that's a very good question. I mean, there, there's, there, there's, there, there's something called, called network mm -hmm. effects. So if you take Facebook, one of the reasons that Facebook was successful is because more people are on Facebook. Yeah? So if, if, if you're deciding, you, you, you don't want to be on a, a, a system that has very few people on it. So the more people that join a system, the better it is for him because uh, you're more likely to want to use it. But we, we, need, to, we need to find... Uh, My own view is that, that, that there are certain fundamental uh, services that, that, that digital media can provide. Let's say search, yes? Very useful to be able to, you know, Google things, yes? The problem with Google, of course, is that it is utterly corrupt. So that, you know, the, 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 the ranking of sites on Google is not determined by how valuable they are in terms of their information. It's determined by a completely different set of criteria. And you often have to look down to page five to find something that's really useful. So we need to begin to design alternatives. We need to, search would be a very good example of that, that we, we, need, we need a search engine that does that that ranks information by its by its veracity and its value so imagine you 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 suspected you might have cancer yeah you, you you're really very worried you want to find out like what are the symptoms what can i do if you use google you'll get all kinds of commercial stuff from the big pharmacy uh companies um there is very good information around but it's not going to be right at the top of Google search. It should be because otherwise you're being misled and you're being uh, uh, given all sorts of information that's not helpful. So we, we, we need to think about having a public presence in these key areas. Social media would be another, another example. I mean, I, I, I really resent, I mean, I, I, I do use Facebook and you're welcome to find me on Facebook, but I have to wade through this interminable number of advertisements, you know, every day for, for things that I really don't care about and are never going to buy. I mean, and of course, they track you. So I, I because I, I teach sometimes in China, I regularly get advertisements for real estate in, in, in Beijing. I, you know, do you want to buy a flat, you know? No, I don't. But I have to kind of wade through all this to get and, and I think that my, my own sense of talking to people is pe people are reaching a limit now. They've had enough of this. It, it, it's not actually not a pleasure anymore. 
So I think there's an opening for something that would be just a very basic way of being in contact with people. And, and, but we have to, there are people capable of designing these systems. And I, I think we need to promote them and, and uh, say, look, you don't have to have all of this advertising and, and, and promotion. We, we could just have an ex the early the early versions were like that. You know, you're too young to remember. But what the, you know, the, the history of the internet is a really tragic history because it, it it was originally designed by enthusiasts who were absolute. They, they had a kind of utopian view of of what was possible. They wanted to build this, you know, uh, uh, network of relationships, and 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 they they did wonderful things, and uh, all for free. Yeah, without any kind of advertising. Um, and then suddenly all of that was laid to waste by the, the big corps that came in and, 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 and colonised those spaces. But the spaces are still there. People still want to talk to each other. They still, want, they still need a search engine. So there's a, there's a space there to move into. And I, I think that, that, that would be a, a, a tremendous step forward. Now I would like to collect some questions. I have this microphone in my hand. Just um, say your question and uh, then I will repeat it so that it's on uh, on the camera. S yes, so just um, ask your questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's easier probably because uh, it's, it's probably not going to be like a quick question that you can easily repeat. So, uh, but you have five minutes left. I know, it's, I'm trying to make it short. It's just, um, uh, in the very beginning, you, 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 had, you showed this graphic um, saying that, you know, most of the CO2 emissions are from uh, the consumption, not like general consumption, but especially the rich, right? And so like it, it, the, the richer you are, uh, the more s you consume, the more CO2 you, you kind of your consumption uh, emits. And, but then it, it kind of felt like the more the examples you gave were more like about like mass, mass consumptions. So more like the, where, where you would kind of might argue oh, the problem is that the poor now get access to stuff that really, sh you know, they shouldn't have. Like, they, they're eating too much meat, they're going too much to McDonald's. Now, th like, the poor also have, you know, like, this access to technology where back in the, you know, like, we, we like, it was like a major, um, like, we, we could afford the radio at some point, yeah, but uh, and now, like, everybody has radio and uh, iPhone and these kind of things. So I'm, I'm just kind of wondering, um, it, it, it stuck in my head, like, where, where, where it's like, where, where would actually, what would it mean to, in, in, in your terms, to critique the consumption of the rich and kind of like to focus on the rich as a problem? Yeah, well, uh, you know... Yeah, so we're just collecting some more questions. Yeah. I think there might be some in the room. <laughs> Christian? Oh, this is... I think I'm also not expecting an answer now, uh, Graham. Uh, very interesting talk. Thank you. We can then continue discussing at uh, dinner, I think. Uh, I think the interesting question is really the alternatives, and you pointed out, well, we need a good life and a good society, and the question is what options there are actually then, and then I think there are the so-called accelerationists who say uh, we need a fully automated luxury communism, but the question is, can that be environmentally sustainable, or is it then uh, a socialist society that also depletes and destroys nature? Uh, so maybe that is something to avoid. Yeah? Uh, and, but on the other hand, uh, if the perspective is an environmentally friendly, digitally detoxed socialism, where we have all live in global poverty and no longer use any technologies, but everything is perfectly environmentally sustainable, maybe that's also something to avoid. So I wondered then how the uh, good digital or non-digital socialist society can be uh, socially and environmentally sustainable uh, at the same time, yeah, and how that framework would look like. Well, uh, that, yeah. I'm thinking maybe these two questions are enough <laughs> <laughs> for the next minute. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, well, that, that is the, the billion dollar question, I think, that everybody is, is struggling with. But to come back, I mean, 
Yes, I, 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 I could have pursued the, the argument about, about the, the, the rich in a lot more detail. But one, one very obvious example is transportation, yes? You, you see that the, the size of cars has actually uh, exploded. You see these gigantic off-road vehicles. The only off-road that they're going to, to use them for is to drive into the car park of the supermarket. You, you, you really don't need that, that, you know, those incredibly destructive. So what's the alternative? The alternative is, 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 is cheap public transport. And, and you see experiments with that going on now. And uh, we, don't, we don't need to indulge the rich uh, to buy gigantic gas-guzzling cars. Uh, and their privilege in doing that is destroying the environment at a rapid rate. But if we had uh, sustainable public transport, uh, my, my city has just uh, taken back control of the buses and they're all electric. Now that's a good step forward, yeah? Uh, they're available cheaply for everybody. And you know, that, that's, it's a small thing, but it's, they're now absolutely crowded with people. People who couldn't, can't afford to buy a car, but also couldn't afford to go into town either. Um, so it, it has all sorts of benefits. Uh, so we need to, we need to think of, of, of public provision in key, in, in key areas. And that will require taking away some things that people have. But I, I, I'm not going to cry over the disappearance of gas guzzling cars. Or I have a prime minister who's now in trouble because he travels between cities 100 miles apart in a helicopter or a jet plane. There's a train that goes between these cities. It takes less than an hour. But no, he can't go on the train. He has to go in an executive jet. Now that's obscene, isn't it? You know, so you know, I, I, I think you know he deserves to be punished. Uh, so yes, the, we, we, so we, we have choices as a society. We have choices, and and we've 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 made a huge fetish of individual choice. People should be allowed to spend their money on whatever they want. No, not if it's socially damaging. So one of the one one of the key. Uh, philosopher, British philosophers of the 19th century is a man called John Stuart Mill and, and Mill is remembered for defending freedom but he adds a very, a very important proviso he says you, 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 you should be allowed to do what you want as long as it does not damage other people so smoking would be a very good example of that yes Smoke, smoking damage passive smoking damages people so there's a, a prima facie case for banning smoking because your, your desire to smoke is damaging people who have no choice in the matter. Um, so that, that's a good principle. So it's not that you want to take people's choices away, but you have to add that proviso that if they're damaging, if the damage outweighs the advantage, social damage outweighs the advantage to you, then there's a reason to stop them. Um, and I think, you know, large gas guzzling cars are a very, a very good example. But to come back to, 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 to Christian's point, we do, we do actually face other problems. Let's suppose we made all cars electric so that they would no longer be emitting uh, damaging uh, uh, emissions. We would still have, we might end up with us and, and if uh, Elon Musk is able to produce a driverless car that, that, that is reliable people who had never driven a car might decide to buy one and say that's great no oh, well, one of those so we would still have cities that were organized around the car yes although we although the cars themselves would be not polluting we would still have an urban environment which was oriented around the car because cars would be, people wouldn't feel bad anymore about having a car. They'd say, oh, you know, I'm not doing any harm at all. Uh, so do we really, so you, you have to think one step ahead. Do we really want cities that are still designed primarily around the car? Or do we want cities that have different priorities? Um, so. 
That's why environment, that's, that's to go back to what I was arguing at the beginning, that's why environmental issues are, are, are not, you can't put them in a box. They're, they're part of a whole, what they, they ripple out into all sorts of other questions. Uh, and, and I think the question of what kind of a city do you want is one of those questions. Um, I, I would much prefer a, a, a city that was uh, safer for pedestrians and, 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 and cyclists and had fewer cars. Um, but I can see that the uh, electrification of transport may, may end up actually intensifying the car saturation in cities, which would be not, I think, a good outcome. So we, it, it's about it's about seeing things in the round, not, not, not seeing them one issue at a time, because they're all interconnected. And that, that's why I'd, I'd urge you to come back to this question of what, what do you think a good life is? What do you think a good city is? Uh, what, what kind of a city do you want? It's not just about pollution, it's about all sorts of other things as well. And, and they all have to be, cons that's what politics is. It's about trade-offs. It's about balancing one thing against another. Um, that's why we have it, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and hopefully we can argue about these things and come to a, an understanding of what, what would be a collective advantage. At the moment, we don't argue in that way. We, we argue issue by issue. And I think that's, that's a real problem. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. My pleasure.